Welcome everybody. Hello and good morning. Uh, my name is Alex Flores, BMI Senior Vice President of Creative, and I am thrilled to be able to moderate this panel, How to Make It in Today's Industry. It is an absolute pleasure to have such an illustrious panel with us today. So to our panelists, before we begin, why don't we go around the screen? I, I'll, I'll call out your name. You can introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about what you do, and most importantly, how did you first envision your career in this industry? So Francisca, good morning. Why don't we start with you? Good morning. Hola, hola a todos, como uh, Thank you for having us, Lalif. Thanks, Alex, for moderating. It's a great pleasure to meet you, even through the Zoom screen, so thank you. Hi. Um, it's a big question. It's, I feel like coffee is kicking in. I'm not sure how much I can answer, but <laughs> I think a quick answer as because I'm, for those, hello, everyone that's connected, for those who, uh, you know, don't know what I do, I am an artist, I'm a songwriter, I perform from Chile. And I think when I started doing music and committing to being an artist and having this and chasing my dream or my passion, I guess, um, to be honest, there was a very big dream of being an artist, but I had no idea how to achieve it. I could barely envision a career. I had never met any adult that was an artist in my life. You know what I mean? So it didn't seem, like it was even an option, really. I was very lucky that I grew up in a family, though there, there was no artist or people dedicated to the arts. They were very supportive with all the siblings, whatever passion we had, and they did everything they could to help us, which has been a gift, you know, and a really great thing I'm grateful for. But that being said, I, you know, I was independent as an artist in, and a musician in Chile to the world for 10 years and just kind of did what I could. And I had a dream about making the music that I was writing and that you know i i think music is such an important means of expression for myself i paint i write i have this kind of like impulse inside of myself to create i didn't even know how it would happen where this could become my work so it was it's been a bit una como dice, a punta de, a, a pulso, you know just step by step making it up as we go sometimes nailing it and growing sometimes failing <laughs> and and you know and having uncertainty which i think is something we all no, but um, but grateful to have committed to a creative life and to learn about myself and the world and connecting to myself and the world through the means of music and creativity. Well, thank you. Uh, we are definitely glad that you stuck with that journey, paso a paso, because we have enjoyed your music so very much. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna turn it over now to Jesus, who's next on my screen. Jesus, can you tell us a little uh -huh. bit about, uh, you know, just introduce yourself a little bit about yourself and how you first envision your career in this industry. Absolutely. Pues no sé cómo le sigo a eso, Francisca. <laughs> but ditto and, uh, you know, buenos dias, buenas tardes. Uh, such a pleasure to be here. My name is Jesus Gonzalez. Some of you know me as Malverde. I am the recently appointed uh, Vice President of Creative Latin at BMI. Full disclosure, Alex is La Jefa. Very happy for that as well. Um, how did I envision? Wow, they say hindsight is 2020, right? So now looking back, it all makes perfect sense. Uh, but as Francisca mentioned, it's such a journey, uh, such an orthodox journey in my case, uh, started as a BMI writer, right? With, uh, you know, definitely uh, pursuing the, the artistic side of it. I transitioned pretty organically to the business side, having been an executive at Universal Latino, uh, still within that passion of artistry, right? In terms of the artistry it takes to create lyric, to hop on stage, but also to be behind the scenes and guiding those that are doing just that, right? So it's really been a, 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 an incredible journey, a Frankenstein resume. Uh, but like I said, it, 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 it's all led to me being here and in retrospect, it's exactly where I'm meant to be. And we're sure glad you're here. Uh, Gil, over to you, you're next. Hey, everyone. Yes, uh, my name is Gil Castellum. I am the founder of Cosmica Artists. And um, I think uh, when I first envisioned wanting to be in the industry, uh, I just really thought that I would hopefully move to Los Angeles and work at a major label, which I eventually did, but uh, I never envisioned pivoting pretty early on 
and going independent when independent was like sort of like a no-no if you were coming from the majors it was like oh you're demoting yourself really um i just really felt uh like I, I don't know it was it felt like almost like a calling to go independent early on and, this, and i'm talking about like uh, the the, <laughs> the mid 90s so um and i've been independent ever since and the you know it with everything there comes, you know, there's pros and cons to that. Um, but I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't trade it, trade my journey, f uh, for anything. Uh, I wouldn't recommend everybody go the route that I did, uh, mm -hmm. cause it certainly wasn't, um, the short, the shortcut, um, or, you know, a shorter trip, that's for sure. Um, and you know, it's just, I'm really happy to be here with you guys and, it really is when these kind of things happen, it's really is, uh, it's like a pinch, pinch yourself type of moment where it's like, really, am I doing this? Am I able to talk about uh, what I do? So it's pretty amazing. Thank you. Well, we're gonna turn it over now to La Guerrera, Miss Lauren. <laughs> what Hi everyone. My name is uh, Lorraine Medina. I'm the uh, founder, owner of Guerrera Marketing and PR. I am a publicist. I do marketing, uh, consulting. Um, it, well, let's see. Um, my journey was sort of bizarre. I uh, studied psychology in undergrad, and I was going to go into forensic psychology. Had a change of heart. Um, then I was going to get my MBA. Um, I connected with a friend of mine from high school when I graduated college and I moved back from Boston to Miami. And she said she started this indie label and she told me all about it. And she sold me this dream. And I was like, oh my God, this sounds amazing. And she wanted to start an indie label. And I had no idea. I had never interned. I had never done anything in music. I was like a case manager. I was totally into psychology. And uh, we started this, this indie label and we eventually signed this uh, female rap artist who ended up getting signed to Sony, Sony Latin. And then long story short, I ended up working for Sony for four years and um, had my stint there. And then I opened up uh, Guerrera. So that is a very condensed version. Um, I never envisioned uh, getting into music. I love music. I always, I always loved music since I was a kid. I was an only child who would wake up my parents at 8 a.m. on a Saturday with el tocadisco full boom, dancing merengue, dancing Madonna, putting on shows for my whole family. Uh, but my dad had a short stint in the music industry. He was actually Joni Pacheco's wife's driver when he left Cuba in New York. So he, um, you know, was he networked and was there when Fania was coming up, you know, he met Hector Lavoe and he met all these people. And so he saw a very dark side of the industry. So when I told him I was going into music, he had a fit. He's like, I no way. <laughs> uh, and now he's super supportive. And here we are, right? Uh, fast forward, uh, you know, two decades later, Jesus, I feel like everybody's Tia here. But um, <laughs> two decades later, here we are, you know, uh, I have had my own business. I've been independent for uh, 10, 11 years now. And uh, yeah, so Guerrera has been in existence for like six, I think, or five. I'm not good at math, but, and I'm also an adjunct professor at USC. So I teach a music PR class at USC. I, I obtained my master's there in 2014. <laughs> and then I told myself, I'm gonna teach at USC one day. And I did, I am four years. And I'm still teaching there, and it's it's quite the quite an honor. So, yeah, that's wonderful. Congratulations, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, last but absolutely not least, Andres Torres, over to you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you for having us. This is pretty amazing. Uh, my name is Andres Torres. I'm from Colombia. I've been here in Los Angeles uh, ten years. Insane, time flies. Uh, I envision my career. I started playing drums when I was five and in a very weird way, I envisioned that I only wanted to do this the rest of my life. And it has been a journey of finding the way to make that happen. Like since I was very young, I knew that I wouldn't do any other job. Like I wouldn't do any other type of work. It will have to be music. So 
Uh, when I started growing up in Colombia, playing with people, I understood that I had to learn how to do all those other things than, than playing drums. So I got into production and then I got into uh, jingles, making jingles, doing all that stuff. And then I moved here and with the same kind of mindset, I started hustling and working with different people. I was an assistant for a very long time for Sebastian Cris and I played with La Santa Cecilia, I worked with Gil back, back like, I don't know, six years ago. And, and I've been doing like, um, always searching for that thing that I, I don't know if I have found it yet. I don't know what's the goal. I don't know where I want to go, but, uh, the only thing that I know is that it's only music. It's only music. That's it. That's my only thing. So, and since, since I was very young also, I knew that, that it was, it was not going to be easy, but I, it also felt like, like it was possible. Uh, so I guess it is possible and I'm here and I'm glad to be speaking with you guys. <laughs> and what an amazing journey you've had, Andres, yeah. definitely. And we've been lucky enough to, to follow your journey and to be part of it in some way, shape or form. And it's been amazing. And I know I can speak for everybody here. We have enjoyed uh, you sharing your gift with all of us. So thank you, thank you for that. Now, I, I, I do want to <clears throat> come back to this amazing powerhouse that is Lord and, and, and really walk us a little bit more through through what you just touched upon. You know, you, your dad, not crazy about you going into the business, totally understand it, similar situation on my end. You, you are at a major, you're set, right? And you decide, I'm going to start my own company. I'm going to go independent. And I love that name, by the way, Guerrera marketing and PR is perfect. Could you, could you tell us a little bit about how did you get your company started and how did you manage to become such a premier company? I mean, you have amazing artists. We were just talking about Jesse Reyes right before we got started and, uh, you know, Messiah and the Marias. Um, could you walk us through that process and how you got here? So, um, it, it was, um, it was interesting because, um, I, when I was at Sony from 2005 to 2009, that's when the industry tanked. And so, um, you know, to be really transparent, they took away my bonus. Um, I had been there already for three years. I asked for a raise. They were like, no, everything's frozen. So the financial part of the industry, you know, um, made me rethink where I wanted to go. I felt like I didn't see myself growing, you know, um, in, in Sony and, uh, the boss who brought me in, who's my mentor, who I absolutely adore and love. And it's like my favorite human is Lorenzo Brown, who, um, so he's the one who, who brought me in, um, my department got dismantled. And so long story short, um, I didn't feel like I had that partner who really um, championed my creativity. And he always treated me like a partner. He never treated me like he was my boss and I was his employee. He always treated me and he really fostered that creativity that, that I still, you know, have. And that really is like, you know, why people hire me, right? Because of, 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 what I bring to the table in the creative sense. And so um, it forced me to rethink everything. And then I saw that there was an opening for uh, social media marketing. And there were really no companies around catering to the Latin space. The ones we did hire were, were just, they didn't deliver. And so I started my own uh, digital marketing company and uh, I just decided to leave Sony and I partnered up with uh, Rocio Gutierrez, who's an amazing um, colleague and friend. And, and we had that business for six years. And then we implemented the PR side because social media marketing changed dramatically and, and our business uh, took, took a hit because it, it became about analytics and it became about all these things that I we weren't, uh, we didn't have the knowledge. We weren't equipped. Long story short, uh, Rocio and I parted ways. And then I had th that moment. I think anybody who's been in, in the industry over 10 years has this moment where they're just like, I don't want to do this shit anymore. You know, I was just like, I'm going to teach. I'm going to do philanthropy. Like I'm done, you know? Um, and then I got pulled back in 
and and I rebranded. I named renamed my company Guerrera because I come from political refugees on both sides, um, Cuban on the Cuban side and the Palestinian side. So I and you know to to be fair, you know and to be honest, being a woman in this industry requires you to have that sort of Guerrera mentality and attitude because de verdad que tienes que fajar much much more than than the boys and y'all know it's true mm. so um and so you know um it just i decided to just be very boutique and very niche in my approach and i focused on uh you know bilingual latinx artists who not necessarily sang in spanish like uh, Omar Apollo, like a Jesse Reyes, like a Kali. Well, Kali now has a Spanish album, but before she didn't. And I really just wanted to champion those artists. And then you know how it is. You do one campaign, one artist. That went well. It started with HL. Remember, Jesus? It started with HL. Then everyone saw what I did with A. And then then came in so-and-so. And then when Jesse came in, then Kali came in. And then Omar Apollo came in. And then Kuko came in. And so it just started happening like that. And... I've worked with artists like Shakira, Maná, Ventura, Calle 13, Romeo Santos. I've worked with some of the greats. I've also worked like some of the most indie, indie, indie artists. I worked Francisca when she first, first, first started, when she did a showcase for BMI at the Gibson Guitar Center. You know, we worked her for um, a while, you know. Uh, so we worked with like developing artists who then became amazing. And then we've worked with artists who just like no one knew and so I've, I've really just worked like the whole gamut and um, I'm here now and I'm really happy with the roster I have. Um, I think they're some of the most uh, creative and unique and their, their, their approach on music is so different. And that's what I really, really love about the artists I've been working with in the last three years. Doesn't sound like an easy journey, but I'm so glad that you, that you had <laughs> accomplished so much and, and you know you do represent an amazing roster and um it is it's not always easy being in the room but it's but you have a lot of love and support from the industry i hope nothing but amazing things about you and and it's uh it's for, for many people so just know that whatever you're doing and everything that you're doing is working thank you thank you so speaking of like not the easiest paths i'm going to turn it over to gil now because gil being a manager, I, I, in my humble opinion, is one of the toughest jobs. You have so much coming at you. You work at record labels. You, 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 were, you were part of a bigger structure than you decided to become indie. And there's so much coming at you at all times and for every, from every angle. What was it about, about this particular um, you know, job that, that really drew you to it? What is it? Is it, is it the fact that everything's coming at you at the same time and you happen to be an amazing multitasker is the fact that you love to be independent. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? It's a, it's a couple things. So, um, and, and it's all, you know, I think Loren actually, uh, it did, hearing her, her backstory a little bit, which some of it I knew, a lot of it I knew, but the one thing I didn't know about was her background, educational background. It totally makes sense because I feel like I've, sat on the virtual chair um, couch, uh, having her open my brain up and, and, and make sure I was okay. So now that totally makes sense to me now. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so a couple of things that I came to terms with a couple of years ago, cause I, I, I did, you know, just like Loren, um, for me many years ago, I did have that moment where I, I, I thought that, um, I wanted to leave the industry and and I wanted to teach. And then I realized when I was trying to get my accreditations, I'm like, what am I doing? I hate school, what am I doing? And so at that time I realized that I was addicted to the drama. Okay, so that so once that was like half the battle there, once I, I, I realized that about myself and then, and then um, I realized that, you know, the whole reason why I started the company, and I'll give you a little backstory of why I started with Cosmic, and I'll try not to be too verbose about it, but um, I, I am, and you, you do hear this term a lot more these days, but I am a person of service, and that's, that's, that's really it about me. It's like, I love to help. That's, that's who I am in a nutshell, and I think that's helped guide my career, whether the artists that I worked with made sense at the time, or the kinds of pivots that I made made sense. It made sense to me, 
and I felt like I was helping the people that I wanted to help. And so, um, you know, I alluded earlier to, you know, not hopefully not recommending people take the path that I took to try to get into this business. So I'm originally from Tucson, Arizona. My sort of first foray in, in, into music and, and, and really loving the, the music that I've grown up with, I've, I've had a, a, a equal amounts of like rock type of stuff and, and Mexican and Latin music. My dad is, uh, is a button accordion player. And so I grew up listening to regional, what's now known as regional Mexican music. Back then you just called it Norteño music um, and especially uh, Tex-Mex or Tejano music. And I was always in the house along with Richie Valens, along from like the funk from my cousins, along with the hard rock of Van Halen from some of my other cousins and my friends in school. So I, um, so naturally when I graduated uh, from high school, I went to University of Arizona. I, uh, amongst many other jobs throughout the entire uh, college career, I worked at a record store. To this day, it's the best job I've ever had because I've got to meet people from all walks of life and I got exposed to much more music than I had ever been exposed to up to that point. And um, it just, it create. I always, I, I had gone to the U of A on a partial scholarship for classical guitar. And uh, so I, I won't go into the stories of why I, I quit playing classical guitar, but I was always fascinated with the business end of things. Like when I would buy cassettes or CDs, I, it wasn't enough just for me to listen to the music. It was always important for me to read the liner notes to see who did what. Like I can tell you that David Lee Roth from Van Halen's bodyguard was Benny the Jet Urquides, who was a, a master at martial arts master. You know, it's like stupid stuff like that. I wish I could remember other things better than that. But um, uh, but uh, while I was at the record store, I made a lot of uh, uh, contacts on the retail side because um, I was the vinyl buyer back when there was hardly any vinyl, but every Friday I was every DJ in town's best friend because you know they had to get that um, that extra copy of Vanilla Ice's Ice Ice Baby of vinyl 12 inch, you know? So, um, so, uh, when I decided I wanted to make the move to LA, I had an opportunity to become a tour manager for, for, for an act. I did that. And, and, and this is, you know, I had hardly ever left the confines of Tucson up to that point. So all of a sudden I went on a six month tour in an RV with 10 people and the, the driver being a Satan worshiper. So that was the first person I had to fire and uh, in his hometown of Minneapolis. Okay. Um, anyways, so when we got back, the tour was over, I came back to LA. And so I had to make a big decision. Was I going to try to stay here or not? And so I, I um, ended up uh, getting another job at the Virgin Mega Store that was on Sunset back in the day. And I lived in my truck for four months. And, uh, and so that was, that, was quite a, that was quite a thing. But I eventually I was able to, uh, I was interning at MCA Records. Back then it was known as the Musician Cemetery of America. Um, and then I got a job as an assistant product manager at a and Records when they were on the Chaplin lot. And uh, eventually I became a product manager and I worked with a lot of great artists. Uh, I worked with Soundgarden, um, Sheryl Crow, uh, Jim Blossoms and whatnot. And then um, I was able to, uh, I, I had a friend from college uh, who, became, who blew up while I was going through all of this and his name was Robert Rodriguez, the film director. And he hit me up out of the blue one day and just says, dude, I, I need help. I want to start a record label for like the acts that I like for my movies. I want you to come and run it. I was like, what? And so I was like, okay, this sounds cool to me. Everybody thought I was absolutely insane for leaving, you know, the confines of a, of a major label. And, uh, and going and doing that. And then really I was ended up being a one man band. I just had to do everything. I had to do everything. And uh, so I, I, I'm going on and on, but uh, yeah. So, so eventually what ended up happening is uh, I was managing an act named, I still manage him 22 years later, Davi Garza um, out of Texas. And he was signed to Atlantic Records at the time and 
uh, 9-11 hit right when he had a record come out and we had a tour, we were on tour with Train and Matchbox 20. Everything got canceled, everything just went away. And I literally had to come back to LA because there was nothing for me when I was living in Austin. One day, phones start ringing off the hook. It was like November 1st, 2001. His record is named number two album of the year in the New York Times, only behind Leonard Cohen. And I'm like, we're back. The next day he got dropped. And uh, so it began a long journey of trying to get him signed again. Because back in the day, there wasn't all the distribution companies that you see now. There wasn't a really a, a indie scene. And so what was happening is I would do showcases for these major labels and they'd say, hey, he's great, man. You should talk to the Latin division. The only problem is David sings in English. So they just were just seeing the name and they were seeing what he looks like. And and we would have meetings with the Latin divisions and then they would say, que es esto? you know, they were like, he, he doesn't sing in Spanish. And uh, so David one day just said, you know what, dude, I can't do any more showcases. You need to start your label. And that's how I, that's how Cosmica started on the label side of things. And uh, so sorry about the long story. I knew I was going to like go on and on. So, but that's how I started. And uh, yeah, again, Alex just, you know, I, a lot of things have come my way. I, I, every time I think that I've seen everything, I'm proven wrong. Um, but again, I'm addicted to the drama, and more than anything, I'm 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 okay with you know things not necessarily always working out our way. But I'm also very very um, grateful and thankful for the things that do. And I, and I like to think that we uh, that outweighs way more than all the other negative stuff that has happened over the years. I think we're going to have to do a separate panel about the driver, uh, the driver of the bus. <laughs> yeah, because it also includes Bill Murray. So I so, so, so we've got to like yeah. a two point zero of this panel to come back to that. So <laughs> we'll to go, but we definitely have to do another one. We'll talk to Lalif about it. But uh, you definitely have worn many many hats, and so has. Um, are Andres Torres, right? You, you've been, you know, you started, like you said, as an assistant engineer working with Sebastian Gris and, and you've been a producer, you've been a songwriter, a dad most recently. Uh, so, and, and you work with some of the, the biggest names in our industry from, again, La Santa Cecilia, to Osuna, to Carlos Vives, to, you know, Ricky Martin, Luis Fonse, you name it. You are behind what I can only describe as one of the biggest songs in the world, uh, which is Despacito. I'm not sure if everybody heard of that song. If you haven't, please check it out. Uh, so I have a couple of questions for you, Andres. First of all, how do you, how do you handle or how do you manage the creative process that you bring to the table versus the creative process of the artists you're working with? And what is your secret to accomplishing all of this? Because you've been nominated for multiple Latin Grammys and you won several and there's a lot that you're juggling and you're doing it very gracefully and it looks just very relaxing but we all know it can't be so give us your secret and tell us what's your creative process when you're in the room with an artist so what what Gil just said resonated a lot with me he said that he's a man of service I realized that recently I think this year that that it's a little bit of my mindset. I I wanted to become, um, I, I don't know if I'm a man of service because it's kind of different, but I what I think about myself is that I want to become a weapon in the studio. So since I since I came here, I did many hats, but the hats that I wore were not because I wanted to do that, but it was because it was a way to get in where I wanted to go. So playing drums live, like uh, being an assistant engineer, all those things. That wasn't my dream. My dream is to do what I do now, that is to be in the studio 24-7 and not think about anything else than music. But I'm not a singer and a, I'm not an artist. So exactly what I, what I wanted to do is to become that person that becomes indispensable for people. Uh, so when an artist that has a voice, that has a creative vision, I wanted to be that person that can go and deliver exactly what they wanted to say. And it's been, of course, a process. It's been, I've learned so much from many people. Um, Sebastian, of course, Claudia Arant, 
And nowadays, since I see six years ago, I become a like a partnership with Mauricio Rijifo, my partner, my production partner. And it's great because I feel like I don't want to do this by myself ever. Like I did it already when I was younger. And this thing is you have to collaborate, especially when you have a personality like me that I'm at the service of the song, at the service of the artist, at the service of the production. So uh, I think that's the only thing that I would say that is a secret, which is not a secret. I think it's a mindset. And for me, it's a winning mindset. If I keep it, when, every time I lose it, I will have a bad session. Every time I think it's about what I want or this vision that I have, it doesn't work out. The, the only time that really works and is what I try to keep myself very grounded in is that um, the only thing that matters is that the song is good. Is the only thing that's my only job. Is that is, is it the best that it can be today? Are we gonna deliver the best bound? And that's what I think is my job in the studio. It can be playing a guitar. It can be staying quiet. It can be being over dramatic and saying like this is going the wrong way. It can be anything. But it's just I think that mindset is is something that has worked for me. And of course, is is not something that. Uh, just a lightning thing hit my head. It's something that I have developed during the years. And like I said, probably this year I could, 2020 was a year where everybody conceptualized a lot of things about themselves. I think this is something that I understood and now I have it, I own it and I'm gonna explode it more. Like I, I know that this is what I do and I think it makes me more confident. It makes me more uh, relaxed, like you said, because I, I am juggling, but I, it, it might sound weird, but I, it doesn't feel like that. Like I, I try to enjoy what I do because I have always, and it's, it's the only reason why I didn't do anything else is because I really love it and I enjoy it. Every time I don't enjoy it, the result is bad. Like all the success that has been in, happening in my career is when I was having fun. When, when, I, when I was deeply obsessed with what I was doing. So um, yeah, I also tried to quit once. I was going to business school because even though I'm in the music things, I'm a very pragmatic person. I'm very worried about the business and this stuff, but I didn't. And I'm glad I didn't. That was like 15 years ago. And yeah, basically. Well, we're very glad you didn't either because <laughs> we missed out on a lot of wonderful music, but thank you, Andres. I'm going to turn it over to Francisca. Please, Francisca, tell me that you've, have you thought about quitting too? I guess that will be the question, but, um, you know, 2007, Muerte de la Lengua comes, you know, premieres to the world. And wow, did you cement yourself as a force to be reckoned with? You did an amazing job with that record. And it really did establish you within our music industry. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your journey since then? You know, Latin pop music has changed so much. And, um, you know, how have you managed to stay true to your your sound yourself but also has have you been influenced throughout this journey and since then by yeah. others yeah it's such a good question also i just want to say i'm so inspired man Como que i listen to everybody right now and i'm like deeply deeply inspired and my admiration for these people and i'm to all you guys which i already have so much admiration it's just like wow i'm watching the movie of their journeys and everyone's so eloquent and they say these things that feel as though they're my thoughts too in so many different ways that we come from different places of the world and different stories and different you know objectives and all these things so i just want to put that out there because i think it's so generous to share those stories and it's all about this kind of potential of transformation through learning through other people's experiences you know it's amazing so anyway como un poco de amor, un poco de amor. <laughs> um, man i don't know you know it's um, I guess it's been, I can't believe it's been this long, like, uh, like Andres was saying, time passes so quickly. It has. And in a strange way, I feel like I'm just starting over again. My career is, starts over every, every year, every new project. And it sounds so maybe cliche, but it genuinely feels that way because you learn so much about yourself. And as people that commit kind of in a delirium to this like, like and this was saying deeply obsessed in a delirium to what you're doing you have these revelations and you're this protagonist that your life kind of pushing forward and i was hearing you know gil and i was hearing lauren kind of like a caballo de carrera right a racehorse you're just kind of like 
pushing and I kind of hear you, Alex. And it's like, I don't even remember half of this stuff. I'm like, I don't even know. It's like the first album came out. I, I mean, that was an album that came like a labor of love, truly. I mean, I was 18. I was, I finished school and I, <laughs> I was playing wherever they let me. I would perform in restaurants, mainly in bars, doing background music in Chile at the time. It was when the music industry was going through this rough patch. So all the labels began to disappear. Um, there was basically no industry, like as an industry, you know, again, music industry, the oxymoron, but there was no industry. There was a lot of music. There was a lot of culture, a lot of arts, a lot of amazing inspirational things, but no industry. And so I genuinely just did what I could at the time. And it's so interesting because he was saying about reading liner notes. And I was, of course, being a lover of music, I would really read all the liner notes of albums and CDs. And I would see there was all this structure around music. There were managers, there were producers. And I was like, there was a label logo always. And I'm like, there has to be a label for the music to exist. It can't be that it exists without this. Um, and when I was 18, I did a full round of label searching in Chile and Argentina and Miami even at the time. And I was turned down constantly. And um, I also think I was not prepared for those conversations as well, looking back, of course. And even five years ago, I was not even prepared. And for many sessions, I wasn't prepared. And since you don't really have, for many of us, maybe you're not lucky enough in time to find a mentor or people to teach you. I mean, Google's your best friend and it's great, but there's so much that has to be learned through the experience of doing it. And it's the journey that you just take. And I'm really grateful that my career has survived in spite of those things, because I think at the end of the day, I've been my worst enemy as the artist, because it's been a journey to discover your voice and what you were saying, to be true to that voice and understand how to really listen to it and what you want and what you want to achieve, who you are, and do that unapologetically and unafraid. And, you know, and really uh, respect that sacred space and that sacred opportunity to be an artist. And I think, that was a big journey in the kind of philosophical aspect of myself, even allow myself to do that. And then came the challenges about making it sustainable and so on. Um, and then I think in terms of what you were asking about the industry changing, when I started, there was the industry or the Latin music idea seemed so far away from me. <laughs> I was like, I don't know, I'm just in Chile doing my music. That was a great thing, I think, looking back, because I just did what I wanted to. and. We did it as a family. I mean, the first album, Muera Lengua, I did it with the band called Los Bunkers, Mauricio and Francisco Duran. They kind of um, godfathered me, which was amazing. They saw me playing at a jazz bar. I was like, I want to be Keith Jarrett. I want to study, you know, I want to be jazz music, a jazz pianist. And they're like, you make great pop songs. Why do you want to be a jazz pianist? I'm like, no, give me an altered 13th chord. I'm like, I was obsessed with all this complex cerebral stuff. And they're like, but you're telling your story. Just be, you know, just be like Andres, just enjoy. Don't you know, don't have, don't be afraid of this voice and all these stories you're telling. And I began to notice that I was writing songs about things that I was, that were genuine, but that I noticed that there, it's like that thing with music. It's like, you want to be told a story of things we all feel, but you don't notice that you don't notice until someone notices it for you, you know? And so all these things were happening and, um, and it seems so far away. I mean, Shakira was around. I loved her. Julieta Venegas was around. I would go to all her concerts in Chile when she came. Eventually, I, I opened up shows for her. And But it seemed impossible. I was like, in no way is like Mexico, how to make an album. And then, of course, with the experience with the labels, it was rough. I was, you know, I felt embarrassed. I felt inadequate constantly. I felt like I didn't know what management did. And just like Andres said, I began to, or he, you begin to acquire all these responsibilities because you just have to, you know, and it was fine. I did it. And I think I've met all of you along the way. I think sometimes jaded because of those roles, <laughs> but at the same time, because I say jaded, because I think it's difficult to switch from the executive brain to the creative brain, go back and forth. It is hard, you know, um, and the fear of how to make this, uh, an actual sustainable career. But what's exciting for me now, I think with the change in music in the industry, is that there is a change in, in, in how we make music, how we can promote music, how music is shared, how it is consumed, who can make it, you know, now I can make it here in my room or I can make it with instruments and I can make up and I can show it to the world in 360 fashion with all the platforms that are available to me. That's exciting. It's, demo, it's democratizing to a certain extent, right? What's also exciting is that the idea of what Latin music is has changed. When I started, it was kind of, the archetypes were very strong. The gatekeepers were very homogeneous amongst each other. And the 
consumption of Latin music and where it was placed and how it was consumed was very specific. I'm excited for how that has changed and the perception of that music has changed and therefore also who makes that music is, ch is changing too. And um, you know, the, the lack of representation, the lack of diversity, all those things are a conversation and it's actually a transformation that's happening. And that gets me excited. It gets, what happens of course, is there are a lot of other challenges, you know, which are, uh, which for, as for everything, the challenge of how do you make this accessible for more people? How do you really um, generate sustainable careers? You know what I mean? All these things. But I am excited though it is a bit overwhelming of the, of the changes, because I do think that now I dream about making music from, from like in a way, to, to say it in a way, from Chile to the world, right? But maybe 10 years ago, that wasn't an option in my mind because it was like, I'm just making it for, you know, Santiago because I was in a centro de Santiago and the idea to dream and to really be ambitious and to be, be whoever I wanted to be, regardless of what was monothematically sounding on the right radio or people were telling me to be um now is different and that i think is exciting and that has informed my music today i want to say because i think i really kind of not only follow my own intuition and voices that i'm constantly discovering but i'm also motivated to be like you know the galiuchis thing i interviewed her for riosa's platform i had and we we're talking about it i was like this is so great you're like i want to sing in french i want to sing in english i want to sing in spanish you can do whatever you want and that's a great thing. And there's room for it to exist, actually, what, outside of the room where you create that music. I think we can all agree with that, right? It's, it's music is, is, is everywhere. And I don't know if there's such thing as genres anymore. There's such crossover and everybody's working with everybody. And I, I find that to be extremely fa fascinating. And, I, and Francis got to your point, some of the best songs have come out of those collaborations, out of those cross genres, out of reaching out and I'm going to sing in French, but because I may be following this particular artist and I may be a fan, I'm going to listen to this song that's in French. I may not know what they're saying, but I'll, I'll listen and I'll follow. And that opens up more opportunities and brings down a lot more barriers, um, which leads me to my next questions for uh, BMI's very own Jesus Gonzalez. Now, Jesus, you've been on both sides of the desk. You've been an artist and now you are a, a, a music executive. And to Francisca's point, right? Our, our affiliates, our songwriters, our artists have so many challenges now. And so there's so much going on. And, and there's, do you think going back to the days when you started as an artist, do you think it has gotten easier with all these platforms that we have now with the Spotify, the Amazons, YouTube, Apple, you name it? Or do you think it's just become a little bit too competitive for, for, for up and coming artists to be able to share their music with the rest of the world? And how has being an artist, a former artist, and now being a, a, an executive helped you in these conversations? Wow. I mean, um, you know, first off, like Francisca said, totally inspired by everyone's just um, you know, everyone's just willing list to, to share, right? Not just the, the limelight, but uh, some of the grind that that occurs in, in our growth and, and on our journeys. I've been very fortunate, um, again, to have, you know, made a pretty organic transition, right? But, uh, you know, necessity is the mother of all inventions. Did I envision I'd be an executive and where I, I was? Uh, or where I'm at, I, I didn't, right? But the path and, and how things transpired led me in that. I think a key in that was the openness, right? There's tunnel vision and being focused, but also an openness to, to recognize the ancillary opportunities that were starting to blossom in the relationships that I was building. Um, as an artist, I got uh, signed to Universal Machete during that amazing period that Lauren made mention to, and everyone went 2005 to 2009, where, you know, here you work towards the goal, you get on the Titanic, and you're like, wow, first <laughs> class, right? And then the ship is sinking, it's like pirateria, I mean, literally, when Univision, Universal purchased Univision's music acts, 400 hundreds of people down to like, you know, less than 100 people cleaning out desks, your radio team, and you're like, wow, you know, this is the dream, but it just, the, the structure was not sustainable, right? I knew my music was hitting because when you went to the alleys, if, you, if, if there was pirateria on your stuff, you're like, okay, we're making it, but there was no DSPs, no way to track it. It was just 
the industry was hemorrhaging and I got to witness that, but I also got an amazing experience of being signed to the label um, initiated by a BMI South by Southwest uh, uh, showcase. Um, but, you know, being on the label side, being, you know, on a, you know, with Daddy Yankee, we seen you on there, Don Omar, we got a glimpse of what's happening now, right? It was like that second wave from the Ricky Martin to, to now the urban, but the industry was not sustainable, right? There wasn't access to it. You couldn't track it, you can monetize it, and it crumbled, right? But within that, you know, I got the opportunity to be exposed to the industry, you know, at, at that level. Uh, so that in 2009, when I, you know, when I, when I got asked to leave, but nobody declined, right? <laughs> um, uh, Gustavo Lopez, uh, who has been a mentor, you know, he, he, he signed me, he left to the former visa side. Um, I was let go. And really from one day to the next, it was my experience as an executive, uh, as an artist that exposed me to the agencies and brands, right? My music was more smoke and word and, you know, more cl clean cut. So I was having these brands, agencies as Jose Cuervos, the Don Julios, and it was a whole other side of the business, right? It was the commerce meeting culture. These brands and agencies wanting to tap into our culture. And I got, you know, to tour with the pit bulls and, and get taken to Guadalajara to the Rojena, right? To see, you know, uh, Jose Cuervo refinery. And it was like, the, in, the initiations of what now is influencer marketing, right? Before IG, before Facebook, before uh, a lot of the social media um, that we have now. So it, it really was a different world. It wasn't sustainable, but I, I value that, that experience because it opened me up to the opportunity and seeing that, that opportunity, right? I have a BA before being signed. I was working at a, at a software company in marketing. So I looked at it from a business aspect. And when I left Universal, literally from one day to the next, again, necessity is the mother of all inventions. You know, some mentors really pulled me inside and said, leverage your relationship. These brands, these agencies want to tap into our cultura, you know, leverage that. So I became a consultant for a lot of these brands, agencies, um, met a lot of the folks here on this panel through that process, you know, working early on with La Santa Cecilia uh, uh, and meeting Andres through, through them, you know, on some brand stuff before I was at Universal uh, with Carla Morrison and Red Bull and Loren on um, PR. So really it was community, uh, you, you know, and, and really learning as we were going and wearing all hats, right? If it's production, if it's, you know, the digital side, as that started evolving and the DSPs came in, um, again, going with the trends, going with where music was heading and the opportunity started, you know, in 2013, or um, I was consulting for Universal, you know, so full circle, here's the gentleman that signed me as an artist, Gustavo Lopez, starts the brand partnership division at UMLE. I'm already doing things more on an independent level, um, but really saw, you know, it opened up like, Imagine if I have now the, the resources and assets, right? I'm only as good as the artists I was representing um, of a UMLE. So I started consulting for UMLE and I tell people he made me the, the godfather offer I couldn't refuse, you know, to go to bring light to the dark side, right? And I started um, with the brand partnership team at UMLE and, and rose to the rank. So in that time, obviously, you know, 2013, the first times we worked with Balvin and Pepsi doing a small pop-up show around, you know, Super Bowl to now, you know, in 2020, you know, Super Bowl <laughs> with J-Lo, Shakira, Bad Bunny, uh, you know, Latin music being on top of the world. A lot of things converged to make that happen, right? Primarily the structure of the music business and the decay that ended, 20 years of decay that all of a sudden started showing profit. And even though there's a value gap in, in the monetization with the DSPs, that's a whole other conversation, there was all of a sudden tracking where pirateria, you don't know where it's at, all of a sudden a little kid in East LA or Medellin or Bogota or DF, you can track it, you monetize it, and all of a sudden hundreds of millions of people, Spanish speakers and people that love our culture are consuming our music. And we saw it with, with the Balvins early on and how that's transpired. So for me, it's been an amazing journey, right? To, to again, look, look in hindsight and be like, wow, all these crazy things happen from artists to going through like that, oh man, getting dropped from the label and you're like, what am I gonna do? But then really finding a lane and calling that again, I didn't foresee that, you know, at the time, one of the biggest opportunities I had gotten up to that point was being an official selection at the BMI showcase in 2005, right? At South by Southwest. Did I ever envision that I'd be the new VP of BMI that gave me the opportunity to be able to pay it forward? No, but it was 
just that openness and that passion for for the art right and there is an artistry to what we do on this side what everybody does on this panel from francisca uh, on, you know on the mic to management, to PR, to Andres creating it, to us, you know, collecting the royalties or in my previous life and brand partnerships and leveraging that. Um, all these things have converged, right, to, to really catapult our culture to where it is now. You know, when our abuelitas, our moms, our tias are in Pandora, are in, you know, on Spotify and consuming, right, when, you know, two years ago, Latin music surpassed country and EDM in terms of consumption in the U.S., right? Uh, there's a power to that. And so I believe, you know, to your point, has that been, or to your question, has that been an advantage? Absolutely, because like Francisco was mentioning, there, there's a balance between creative and, 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 and the business side. And it absolutely is a business. And when the opportunity came for me to be able to serve on this side to what everybody's, you know, being someone of service, um, it was almost nuestro deber, right? A lot of the heartache I went through as an artist, right? Because maybe the person on the other side of the desk wasn't as passionate or didn't recognize, like, this is my life and it's a folder or a file on your computer, right? I knew that me being this person, I was bringing that passion and I really gave a, a you know what about your livelihood. And I would do everything in my power to leverage our resources to try to amplify those efforts, right? So it's always been about service to the art and being able to push the culture, right? Para la cultura forward. And, um, you know, and here I am again, would I ever think that the label I got signed to drop, I would be one of the top executives there at Universal at one point. And now again, shifting here. So if anything, I, I, I believe I wasn't dreaming big enough, right? But here we are and I feel so grateful and fortunate to be looking back and it being so clear, right? That this was my calling and now I can share our insights and knowledge. And that's what everybody is doing here. So just super, you know, humbled that I'm even at the table here, guys, so. We're definitely glad you're at the table. Yes, it is. So we're, before we open, um, before we open it up to questions, just very quickly, I really want us to go around the screen one more time. Our panel is, called how to make it in today's industry, music industry. So in a few words, Jesus, what would be the advice for anybody who wants to make it into this, in this music industry? How do I get uh, Jesus Gonzalez to, to pay attention to me? Well, lo primordial is protect your art, educate yourself, right? If you're not affiliated with the PRO, <laughs> shameless plug, be my, um, no, but educate yourself. This is your livelihood, your art. It is also a business, right? Leverage technology, right? It has democratized access. It has democratized distribution. It has democratized our abilities to, again, cut through the noise, right? And leverage this, right? Leverage opportunities to grow your network because in the end, it's the people that you meet and grow with in this, in this industry that will always uh, be your key to that next level. Gil, what about you? What would be your advice? I would say be consistent. And, and, and in addition to consistent, you got to be consistently creative, consistently organized, consistently focused, consistently confident in your, in your convictions also. Like be confident in what you're doing. Um, there's nothing worse than having an artist that um, is unsure about themselves. It's fine to be nervous about it. But like if you're it, it, one of the worst things you can be is sort of like between two decisions and you can't make it and you get uh, paralysis by analysis. Um, and then be consistently curious. And it, as Jesus just said, educate yourself. And also, in addition to that, as you get more experience, also also remember to educate others, because I don't I, I what I want to I would love to see before I'm not of this earth is to not have these conversations about culture and whatnot and how we're trying to get in. Like we're seeing this stuff again, I, I don't wanna deviate from that, but yes, so so consistency. Andres? So I would say that being honest with yourself because like the panel is called making it on the music industry, but that I don't even know what that means. 
I think that means something very different for each person that dedicates its life to, to music. So I would say just be very, very honest of what you want and do what you want to do. For example, in my case, it was not being ashamed of dreaming very big in the pop world, even though I grew up studying with jazz musicians and and very like I wasn't the cool guy. I like the the non cool. I was the guilty pleasure guy that liked the music that, and I was always honest with that. I like it, and I pursue that, and I um, wasn't ashamed of that. So being, I think, being very very honest with with yourself and looking at the mirror and saying this is for me making it. It's not what the book says. It's not what other people do. It's because you have different skills. Everybody's different, but I believe that everybody can make it in their own way and their own version of success. That means many things. It may meant huge, it may mean small, but it, it it means making it. So uh, yeah, being honest. Francisca, what about you? Man, like, 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 mas uno, mas uno to everyone, what everyone has said, 100% agree um, to all of the comments made so far. And I was gonna start, I wanted something very similar to what Andres said in terms of it depends what, what you want. This is something I, I feel like I'm still learning about myself and the journey I want and what success looks like for me and what is important to me in a professional and in a personal human way. What kind of life do you want to live? You know, I think also, um, you know, Gil said that doubt is the biggest enemy for an artist. I also agree. I also think this depends who's asking, right? Because I think here we have a panel of different professionals and I think it depends on what you want to achieve because you can be, you can design to work in, the, in this industry the way you want. You can be an artist that's 100% an artist that's like, I don't want to do this other stuff, or you can be, I want to have a PR firm or whatever. So it depends on what your goal is and what kind of career you want to have. But I do agree that from the artist side or the, you know, pursuing the creative thing, um, commit to the conviction. I say that to myself every day, to your own delirium, to your own voice, um, work hard, know what you want or try to know what you want. Um, say yes to things in terms of explore, grow, be curious, but also you're probably going to work in many things you don't think you're going to work in and you're going to have to learn how to do it anyway. And that's great too. Um, uh, also you will think about quitting. Alex was asking, have I ever thought about quitting? Oh man, after my third album, I, I had like a breakdown and I had to work on other things for two years. I was like, I can't do this. And the insecurity was consuming me. The doubt was consuming me. I didn't, I felt so, I mean, it was rough. So I think that the, the mental and health and emotional challenges and the support system you have and all those things are important. I also think in terms of a, an industry thing, it's important to, I feel, um, to try to act and build the industry you actually want to work in. You know, uh, I really believe in alternative white forms of leadership and I believe in representation and diversity. And I think in that sense, it's important to also have that in your mind while you make decisions, while you make teams. Um, and I think, joy and kindness and though and empathy though they sound almost like abstract terms are important too in an industry that's about desire and comp you know comp competitiveness and all of these things so i don't know especially because we're in an industry if you're making songs about emotion or about you know about things that that generate things emotion feeling and freedom so it's um yeah i don't know and work hard always it's a long unexpected ride and success doesn't look the same for everyone and as i say in Ridosa, there's not one way to be successful or not one way to be a woman or not one way to be a human in as a creative in, you know individual well there's a mic yes thank you <laughs> miss lord so i to piggyback off what everybody else said i agree with wholeheartedly with what everybody said. I think the two things for me, my advice uh, would be to be vulnerable. I think um, a lot of artists don't understand how, how, is, how important it is to be vulnerable as a, as a human. I think this generation uh, really connects with artists um, on that level of vulnerability and what Francisca said, you know, empathy. Um, and I'll give you a, a really clear example. I think what makes Cardi B a lot more likable and lovable versus Nicki Minaj is that we see Cardi at her lowest moments. We see her completely unstripped, no makeup. We just see her broken down and she is really honest about who she is. And I think everyone really champions 
like her. So um, for me, there's two things when I take a client, I, I look at two things. I look at story first and foremost, and then I look at originality. You know, um, I, I my advice is like, how are you going to rise above the noise? What makes you different? I don't care how many followers you have. You can bring me an artist that is that has who has 50 million followers. And I, if I feel like they don't have a story and there's nothing there, there's no real vulnerability. There's no real like I'm doing this and this is different. I'll, I'll, it'll be a pass for me, you know, but that's me. Right. And so I think Gen Z. Um, this is a tar this is your target demographic. You can't lie to these kids. You know, you have to be honest in your approach. You have to be vulnerable. And I think that's what makes that's what makes Bad Bunny who he is, his vulnerability as an artist. You know, uh, the fact that you know a, an urban Latin artist is championing you know uh, a transgender. That, that was never done before his fluidity in fashion, um, him being able to, to, to channel both female and male, but still be very, you know, male in, in his approach. Um, I think that has worked so beautifully for him and he has never been afraid to be vulnerable and to be really, you know, to say what he feels. And, and that's, that, that was an, he's an anomaly. He's an anomaly. So I think those, those, besides what everyone else said, I would say those two things. Can I, I add something to what Laura? Oh, sorry. Vulnerability makes you, it, it's a strength. Is And I think that many people can see that as a weakness, but it's not. It, it takes guts to be vulnerable and mm -hmm. to be true to who you are, right? Be transparent. It's not an easy thing to do. Francisca, forgive me, but you were going to say something. I mean, beautifully, beautifully put. Muy bonito, Alex. You're so right. I absolutely agree. I'm like, I made a whole album in 2020 about it. I'm, I'm there for vulnerability. But I was going to say, um, I just wanted to add something that Lauren made me think is I think also the vulnerability also comes hand in hand with the ability to listen to yourself versus the noise outside. You said it rise above the noise. And there's so much noise in every sense of the word, what's happening in the world today. And I think if you do want to have vulnerability and have the ability to connect, it's also knowing when to listen and who to listen to, because there is so much noise coming at you as a human and as an artist and as someone that's putting themselves out there. And I think the other thing that at least I talk a lot about in workshops and stuff we do um, is ask questions, man, like un unapologetically. I, when I started, I asked questions to everybody. I emailed every singer I had once met anywhere. And I was like, how do you become a singer? What does it look like? I'm like, if you have a band, is it your band? Do you pay them? Do you not pay them? Like I had no idea, you know? And also Google is your best friend, like a hundred percent Google, Google, everything. And, um, and that seems simple and obvious, but I think it, there's no, there's no a downside to just asking questions and being curious and open. Well, I'm going to move on to some questions. Um, uh, bear with me. Okay. Question number one from, uh, David Murillo. Thank you for this panel on the artist side. When do you feel it's a good time for to engage with a manager and how did the relationship, how should I this relationship develop on the manager side? When does an artist turn into a potential client? I'm assuming that's probably for me, maybe no. <laughs> uh, the manager. I know, I know one. Manager? <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, you know, the thing about the artists that are, it, it, it's almost like dating. It's like, you know, when you least looking for something, something happens. Um, it's the thing that I can tell you is that you could, you have to continue to do what you're doing. Okay. And again, going back to what I said before, it's like being consistent. Um, you know, people send me really nice emails all the time and Nine times out of, out of 10, I'll at least listen to the music and get back to them as much as I possibly can um, with some advice. And, um, you know, uh, I just met with an artist that we're going to sign for management that I met uh, two and a half years ago that um, hit me up back then, didn't have any music. He just, he literally sent me a video of him playing his acoustic guitar. And I said, you know what, that's really great. Um, I, I, you know, encourage you to continue your journey and, you know, when things start, you know, come back and check with me in, in a year or two. And so it, he checked in with me last year, still didn't feel like it was right, 
he checked in with me a couple of weeks ago and it, and it felt right because he was doing all the things that an artist needs to do is basically as Jesus alluded to and Francisca as, as well, is like you continue to work on your artistry, you, you, you educate yourself, you learn about different things and that will show. And um, so when you have that really nice balance between your creativity and understanding a little bit about the business, you don't need to be a business major to, to, to be impressive in that area, but knowing how to at least carry yourself and, and, and move forward, that becomes a very attractive um, presentation for somebody to want to work with you. I hope I answered that. <laughs> Absolutely. Here's another question. So this is for everybody uh, on the screen. What has been the proudest, most rewarding moment in your career? This is from Omar Hernandez. Lauren, we're going to start with you. You're right at the center of my screen. Wow. Um, whew. Sheesh. I've had many. I guess maybe I, I, can I do five? Uh, <laughs> one was starting at Sony. Um, getting hired at Sony. The other one was becoming a professor at USC uh, because I do teach at Thornton, the music school, so it is related. Uh, recently, I was able to get two of my developing acts uh, to perform at the Latin American Music Awards. I did that. My little self did that. No, no label behind it, which we already know how that works. Um, they have a really strong hold on the award shows and I managed to get that. That was probably one of my proudest moments uh and i um i think leaving sony also like it's like starting at sony was one of my proudest moments and also leaving because um it takes a lot of courage to just pack up your bags put everything in a car travel across the country with 700 bucks and say you know what i'm gonna start a new life i'm gonna start at a new company i'm not i'm not 100 percent sure of what i'm doing but i'll figure it out and here i am so i think those would be those would be four. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Sus, what about you? Wow. Wow. Getting hired at BMI and having such an amazing chingona jefa. Does that work? <laughs> that is one of them. Um, I, I mean, there's so many. I think for me, one that stands out is when, when I left Universal, people thought I was crazy. I went to a, a global, you know, general market agency. I was there for eight months as fate would have it. Gustavo Lopez, who I mentioned, you know, left Universal to start his endeavor and I got called back. I left as director within eight months. I left as VP at this agency and SVP eight months later asked to come back to lead the division um, that I had started at, you know, not, not too long prior. I get into my new office and one of the first calls I get is someone looking for me, not as, Jesus Gonzalez, but as Mel Verde, because they wanted to clear my song called Marcha. You know, a lot of my music was social justice. My mom, I'm first generation Mexicano born aquí. She worked in agriculture in the Coachella Valley, Cesar Chavez. So they wanted to clear my song for the Dolores Huerta documentary trailer. So I got to say it was such a full circle that this desk that I had the blood, sweat and tears to just get a meeting with the gentleman that had sat there as president of Machete and then hired me in the many meetings I had with his guidance and mentorship. And here he was, you know, passing the baton and I'm sitting at this desk. And then my song Marcha was used for literally one of the inspirations, you know, my passion and purpose was always to inspire that if a little mocoso kid from Cochelita could aspire to be the first in family to graduate, to get a white collar job, to pursue their dreams, then anybody could. So. I gotta say that was a full circle and one of the things I treasure to this day. Did you approve the clearance? You know what? I called film and TV and it was literally <laughs> that week and we cleared it right. and my song is now on the Dolores Huerta documentary. Andres, what about, what about you? Proudest, most rewarding moment in your career? In my career, uh, I, I think I have a little bit of a hard time sometimes realizing when good things happen because I, I feel anxious that, that if I don't keep going, it's like, it's gonna end, you know, it's, it's a weird feeling, but it's like when a song hits number one, I don't, I, I kind of want to, don't want to look at it because I want to do the next one and I want to do the next one. But last year, uh, 2020, uh, 
was a weird year for everybody. And we got the uh, Latin Grammy for producer of the year, Maurice and me. And it was a dream since, of course, forever, but it, it was on Zoom and I was in my house and I just had a kid. And all of a sudden on Zoom is like the our category and my wife is in the room, like getting makeup and we won and we're like, hey, we just won a Grammy. And what is happening? And I went to see her and it's like, we're in our house and my dream just came true. I'm producer of the year this year. What is, and it was so completely bizarre and completely not what I have dreamt. It was like, you dream about those things, of course, when you're in, in, in what I do, I would dream that I get the award and I say this thing with, right? No, it was like, thank you to everybody. And it was like, Zoom. And that's it. That was the moment. But And I think it was so unique that I'm going to remember forever the, the feeling. It was like I let myself that day feel the joy of what was happening. Usually I have that thing in my head that it doesn't let me, but that day was very, very special. I got to share it here in my house with my wife and my kid. And that was it. It was, we just did it. We just did something really incredible. First in my family, first in many things. This is pretty incredible. So I think that's, yeah, pretty good moment. That's a great moment. Yeah. Uh, Gil, over to you. I mean, there's there there is a lot to be you know thankful and and to be proud of for sure. Um, I think probably one of the ones that stand out for me are actually two things. Uh, back in 2012, when when Carla Morrison won um, uh, two Latin Grammy awards. I remember like literally she had to leave for a tour of Chile right after. And it was just such a whirlwind. Um, I didn't really get a chance to really process it until I literally sent them off on a plane and I got back to the hotel and I just literally broke down and cried. Finally, I just, I think it finally had hit me of everything. And, and, and one of the big reasons she turned back and she said, thank you so much for helping me make my dreams come true. And so that was one. And then, and then, uh, you know, we've been lucky enough to, to have before, um, the, the live show stuff, um, go away for, for a bit because of the pandemic. Um, you know, the last four years of Coachella having an artist or two artists perform at Coachella, because prior to that, I had a, a secret, um, pact with myself that I would never, um, go to Coachella until I had an act play there. <laughs> now, that was great when I finally, Carla was the first one to play for us. Now, not the smartest thing to do, not going to Coachella because um, logistically, when you go there and having to deal with all the logistics of a Coachella and you've never been there, it, yeah, I should have probably gone at least once to know what the lay of the land was because that was crazy. I didn't realize I was have to go to, get um, golf carts everywhere, but yeah. So th those are some of, of, of many, but uh, those would stand out. We'll save the rest for like our 2.0 <laughs> panel, right? We'll talk about the bus driver and the rest of yeah. the, the best moment. <laughs> Francisca, what about you? I, it must be hard to pick one. I mean, you wrote your first song at 13, right? And what a song, but try to pick like one of the most important moments in your career. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful question because it has so many facets, right? You can go in, in so many directions to answer this, but I think that, and I think also objectives change, so realizations change. So what, what, when you start what feels like a big thing, a milestone, and it is at the time, many times, like Andres says, you don't even notice it's a big thing. You don't enjoy it. You don't stop to even value it or incorporate it. You just kind of like rush through. Um, and then it move, and then object time passes, you grow, objectives pass, and you're like, huh, that doesn't seem so difficult anymore, or, the, or as an achievement, I achieve something, I want something different now. Um, but I think, I, 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 would, I would imagine that, that being said, there's a few different things. I, I, on the one hand, there, of course, there are certain events or milestones that are valuable, whether it's recognition from your peers, whether it's certain stages that you've dreamt of, collaborations that you've dreamt of. Um, you know, I think of recently in the last album, I have a song called Al Final del Mundo, which is dedicated to Chile. And I got to play the song with my the pianist that I grew up listening to, Claudio Parra, he's from Los Jaivas. We do it, we performed in a festival de Viña right before the pandemic, two pianos back to back like this. Um, and it was a dream of mine, he's, you know, 80. So for example, there are certain things like that, that, you know, that kind of like 
you they're close to your heart for whatever reason musical reasons you know you feel excited about your work i do think that in a more general sense i'm proud <clears throat> i'm proud of um i'm proud of the fact that i um sorry <clears throat> The fact that you be, you build relationships and you are who you are and you're able to build a career being who you are, I'm really proud of this, you know, because in the I get all emotional because it is like a, an emotional moment of pandemic and I think it's really difficult to not um, to first commit to, to to commit to being an artist or commit to a profession that has to do with creative endeavors. I think it's a difficult moment. I think it's difficult to be vulnerable and I think it's something I've done in my whole career in one way or another especially through my music and I'm excited for that. And I think back to a moment, we have a show right before the pandemic where the electricity got cut off and everyone kept singing the songs and they were singing the song I have called Diano de Ti, which is about an abusive relationship. And it's a song that came out here in this room in pajamas in one city. And it was this therapy that came out and I, I was, it was so deeply enthralled in my gut. It just came out and I was like crying and I, singing this song I was singing a song and the lights get cut off and I have thousands of people singing every single syllable back at me and it's a wordy ass song it's like and they're all singing it singing it singing it and I'm like and I'm just like this is a song that was born from my gut here in this room and they're singing it back at me and this is what brought me here the songs this is what brought me here who I am this is what I'm making a living with the songs you know and just to feel that kind of whole whirlwind um, of, you know, when I was a kid and I would dream like, like, uh, and this was saying, I would dream about being on stage and I had a Fisher Price mic and there are all these photos of me with my four siblings, like, ver show, escuchar show, escuchar show. And then fast forward, that's what I get to do, play dress up, sing songs, you know, have a craft. I think that that in itself is something I try to look as an achievement and an accomplishment, the fact that I get to do that and also dream about what's next. I think, I hope that even more beautiful things are before us. Um, and I'm just grateful for that opportunity and grateful that, you know, the relationships are there, the confidence is there, the desire is there, um, and the ability is there because it's a craft, like others was saying also, you have to hone it. It takes a minute, you know? Yes, I, I, I could not agree with you more. And um, unfortunately, we're, we're out of time, but I, I do want to thank you all for you know, sharing and being so, so open with us, sharing your journey. This, this is, this is not always an easy path. And uh, I, I know I can speak for all of us. You know, we, from time to time need a little motivation, uh, a little bit of inspiration and a lot of heart and passion to keep going. And I just want to say, you know, you, you, you've all traveled different paths to become a source of inspiration and have chartered course for those who want to follow in your footsteps. Uh, if I had to use a word to describe you all, I would say trailblazers. Uh, you are opening doors, you are giving back, you are setting the tone for many. And I want to thank you for doing that. It has been my absolute honor to start my day with all of you. And thank you so much for sharing, not just your journey, but also about yourselves with our audience today. Thank you, everybody. And thank I look you so forward much. to seeing you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lali. Thank you. Good to see you guys. Thank you, everybody. It was great to